Today's probability problem comes to you originally from the 1989 Putnam exam. Let alpha in 01 be an irrational number. Describe a finite game with a fair coin so that the probability of winning is alpha. And I saw this problem for the first time on Michael Penn's excellent channel, where he did a full blackboard solution using chalk that really explains what's going on very nicely. This video is a picture proof of the solution. Mihai from the future here with a quick update. When I originally recorded this video, I really thought I was doing the exact same solution that Michael Penn did, but with visuals. Uh, and then after I recorded it, I was like, no, wait, this is a totally different solution. Like, I cannot see how they are the same. Uh, and then I thought about it some more, and there's a really clever way you can actually map the two solutions to each other by just reinterpreting what these coin flips mean. So if you want to see that, there, I added a chapter at the end of the video that I'll explain it all. Okay, back to old me. So I have here drawn the interval 01, and I'm going to show you with pictures and little dots and stuff that go on here how the solution works. So to start with, I have the number alpha that we were given, the irrational number between zero and one, and I've drawn it on my little interval. And you can see I've even color coded in the region zero to alpha. So this is an interval of length alpha living inside my interval zero one. And now I'm gonna do something very simple. I'm going to draw a uniform random variable uniformly from the interval zero one. So here it is, here's my uniform random variable. It ended up by chance being right over here. It's a uniform random variable, so the chance that it ends up in any interval is just proportional to the length of that interval. Uh, to see what I mean, let me resample it a bunch of times and you'll see how it moves around and how it's chosen. So here I'm just resampling uh, this u variable, which is a uniform, over and over and over again. And you can see that, where does it end up? It ends up all over the place. What is the chance it ends up in this blue interval, which represents zero to alpha? It's exactly alpha. So the chance of it ending up in any region is just the length of that region this region is exactly length alpha, so the probability it ends up over here is alpha. What was the problem? We had to make an event of probability alpha. Look, we just did it. So if the game is, if u is less than alpha, then you win the game. If u is bigger than alpha, you lose the game. You'll have an alpha probability of winning. Yay, we did it. Um, problem though, the, the question said use fair coin flips. And I didn't use fair coin flips, I cheated. And I used a uniform random variable. Um, but here's the thing, you can make a uniform random variable, just like this one, out of fair coin flips. And that's the secret to the problem. So basically, we want to make this uniform random variable work. But to make it out of fair coin flips, we need to combine it using a binary decomposition. So what we have to do is look at the decimal expansion of this random number u between 0 and 1. But don't look at the decimals in base 10, look at them in binary. And if you do that, you can write u as a sum like this. So it's the sum from j equals one to infinity of cj divided by two to the j. Those cj's, those are the binary decimal digits. Uh, the two to the j is just like in ordinary decimals, we're used to tenths, hundredths, and thousandths. In binary, we do halves, quarters, and eighths, and so on. So the cj's are the decimal digits, and the two to the j tells you the value of the place. So we have this, these cj's. And here's the remarkable thing about the cj's, is if u is uniform, those cj's, they are bare independent coin flips. Why is that true? The reason is simple. You can look at the regions where CJ is either one or zero and see that it always takes up 50% of this interval zero one. So to give you an example, let's look at the set of points X whose first binary digit is one. And it's actually very simple. It's just the points that are greater than a half. All the points that are greater than a half, they are a half plus something. All the points that are less than a half, they are uh, zero plus, and then all the other digits. So if you, if you write their first binary digit, it's one over here and zero over here. And now you notice that the uniform random variable u is equally likely to have a one or a zero. So that's C1, the first coin flip, 50-50, either one or zero. What about the second decimal digit? If you look at the second decimal digit of u in binary, you'll see that it's one if u is over here or over here. It's these two intervals of length a quarter. That is where the second decimal digit is one. And you can see, once again, these take up 50% of the entire region the chance that it's one is 50%, the chance that it's zero, there are these two intervals, the complement is also 50%. And this works no matter how many digits you look into. So the third digit looks like this, the fourth digit looks like this, the fifth digit looks like this. And in all cases, the binary digits of a uniform random variable, they are fair coin flips, either one or zero. Okay, fantastic. So now we have written the problem, which originally said using only fair coin flips, please find a way to make an event of probability alpha, and we've done it. So here's what you do. You take your fair coin flips, you combine them with this infinite sum to make u, and then you just say, is u bigger than alpha or is u less than alpha? If u is less than alpha, that is an alpha probability event, and we are done. Uh, 
okay? Except there's one other problem, which is the problem said make it a finite game. And this is not a finite game. This involves infinitely many coin flips. So other than this last little wrinkle of using infinitely many coin flips, we have figured out how to use coin flips to make an alpha probability event. The last thing you gotta do is figure out how to tell if u is bigger than alpha or less than alpha without doing the full infinite sum. So, of course, if you had the full infinite sum, it would be very easy to tell if it's bigger than alpha or less than alpha, but it turns out you can tell if it's bigger than alpha or less than alpha just by looking at partial sums of this infinite sum. So in other words, you don't have to sum all the way to infinity, you can sum up the first few and then you can tell. Uh, let me show you how to do it. So here's how we're gonna do it. Instead of getting the value for u exactly, what we're going to do is make a sandwich that sandwiches u in some region. And the sandwich starts very simply. We're gonna say u is definitely bigger than zero and u is definitely less than one. So it's somewhere between these two pink bars, somewhere trapped in this pink region. And as you add more and more coins, what's going to happen is this region is going to shrink down towards u. So using a finite number of coin flips. So for example, here I'm using five coin flips. I will not know the value of u exactly, but I will be able to narrow it down that u is somewhere in this region. And once you have narrowed down u to some small enough region, you will be able to tell if it's bigger than alpha or less than alpha. In this situation, u is somewhere in this pink region, it's definitely less than alpha. It's definitely contained in this big thing. Mihai from the future here again. After I recorded the video, I came up with a really intuitive explanation of how this pink interval is shrinking down to the number u that is too adorable not to include. And all it is, is imagine you're playing the game 20 questions to find the value of u, and at every point, you just repeatedly ask, are you in the left half of the interval or the right half of the interval? My first question for you to figure out where u is, is u in the left half or the right half of this pink interval over here? u is in the left half of that interval. Okay, my second question for you, is u in the left half of the pink interval or the right half of the pink interval? This time, u is in the left half of the interval. Okay, but my follow-up question, is u in the left half or the right half of the interval? Now u is in the right half of the interval. Okay, but this time, is it in the left half or the right half of the interval? <laughs> now it's in the right half of the interval. Okay, now, is it in the left half or the right half of the interval? Left this time. So this 20 questions thing, asking is it in the left or the right every single question, is completely equivalent to the mathematical upper and lower bounds you're about to see, uh, but maybe it's a little bit more intuitive. Uh, anyway, back to what we had before. So how can we make these bounds and what are they? Let's rewind a little bit. Let me show you what the bounds are. The bounds are simply the partial sums of this infinite sum. So u is equal to the big infinite sum, but it is bounded by partial sums of this sequence. The very first simple partial sum is to say that u is at least the first few terms of this sum. So the terms of this sum are always positive, so u is definitely bigger than any partial sum. So if you use zero coin flips, you'll get that it's bigger than zero. If you use, uh, say, three coin flips, here the third coin flip happened to be one, and so uh, you know that u is at least an eighth. And these, these uh, bounds, these partial sums, they are converging, starting at zero, and they're going up, 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 all the way to u. That's the left-hand side that is bounding u. Uh, that was the lower bound. Let's do the upper bound. U is bounded above by the partial sum plus 1 over 2 to the 1. Where did this 1 over 2 to the 1 come from? Well, actually, the worst case scenario for you is that the infinite sequence of coin flips works out to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 after the term we're on. So the first coin flip, that's written here, cj over 2 to the j, summing from j equals 1 to 1. What's the worst case scenario for 2, 3, 4, all the way up to infinity? They could all be 1s. And if they're all ones, you have a geometric series that adds up to a half. So u is definitely less than the first few terms plus one over two to the one. And as you add more coin flips, the amount you're adding on is shrinking. So if you add on two coin flips, u is definitely less than this plus a quarter, and then plus an eighth, and then plus a sixteenth, and so on. And so actually the width of this pink interval is always one over two to the number of coin flips we're using. If you try to approximate u with 10 coin flips, this interval that you can sandwich u in is size one over two to the 10. So this interval shrinks down to zero as you go, and you eventually have very good control over where u is using only finitely many coin flips. So here's why this always works. 
Because the size of this interval is always 1 over 2 to the n, where n is the number of coin flips we used, we will always be able to tell if u is less than alpha or bigger than alpha as soon as 1 over 2 to the n is smaller than the distance between u and alpha. So in this situation, u and alpha are pretty far apart, and we can immediately tell, almost immediately, after just using one coin flip, we know that u is somewhere in this pink region, definitely less than alpha, and we're done. In a different situation, we might need to use more coin flips. Here's an example. So here's a situation where we're going to need more coin flips because the value of alpha and the value of u happen to be quite close together. So remember, we don't know the value of u, we're sort of slowly over time discovering where u is by narrowing in on it using some number of coin flips to decide where u is. So without any coin flips, u is somewhere in 0, 1. That's not very helpful. If we use only one coin flip, we know that u is going to be bigger than a half, but less than 1. So we cannot tell just based on one coin flip in this situation if u is bigger than alpha or less than alpha. And that's because with one coin flip, we only know that u is somewhere in this pink region. It could be this part of the blue region where it's less than alpha, or it could be this part over here where it's bigger than alpha. Okay? So we need more coin flips. Let's do a second coin flip, and this time the interval shrinks the other way. And so now our interval has shrunk, but we still are unsure about whether or not u is going to be less than alpha or bigger than alpha. So in this situation, it could be that u is somewhere in this region, and then it's less than alpha, or it could be this little region over here, and it's bigger than alpha. Based on the first two coin flips, we do not know where it is. It's somewhere in this region, but we don't know where. So we need more coin flips. Let's do a third coin flip. So using the third coin flip to bound to the position of u, we now know that u is somewhere in this region. So we're shrinking the region down, we're getting more and more accurate, but we still have not yet figured out if it's bigger than alpha or less than alpha. So we could be here in the little region, or it could be over there. We don't know. Um, and again, in, in this situation, I'm drawing, I'm showing you the position of u, the final infinite sum, so you can see how things are narrowing in on it. But in real life, we would only have the first three coin flips, we wouldn't have the full value of u to work with. So we'd only have the first three coin flips, and the best we can do is make these bounds that u is somewhere in this region. Okay, what if we do more coin flips? So with the fourth coin flip, we narrow it in even more. Still, that in this region includes parts that are less than alpha and parts that are bigger than alpha, we need more coin flips. If we include a fifth coin flip, then we finally have got it. So by the time we've gotten to the fifth coin flip, the interval is so small that we know that u is somewhere in there that we can tell for sure that in this situation u is bigger than alpha. And we can always do this as long as the interval we narrow it down to is smaller than the distance between u and alpha. So as soon as 1 over 2 to the n is a less than u minus alpha, we will be able to tell whether or not u is to the right of alpha or u is to the left of alpha. And this is the secret. This is why the algorithm always eventually works. For every single point on the number line, no matter what u is, no matter where it ends up, it is always some distance away from alpha. Um, I, I should say, okay, this, this is actually uh, an interesting thing in probability. If u equals alpha, we're screwed. It's not going to work. It's never going to work. We're never going to be able to find out if u is bigger than alpha or less than alpha. But fortunately for us, that has a 0% chance of happening. So I shouldn't say we can always tell. I should say we have a 100% chance of being able to tell apart uh, the position of u using these intervals from alpha as long as u is not equal to alpha. And u is not equal to alpha, that happens with a 100% chance. And whenever, no matter what point u you pick, there's always some small space between u and alpha as long as u is not equal to alpha. And then you can narrow down using this algorithm and eventually you will be able to distinguish if u is less than alpha or u is bigger than alpha. So here's a quick write-up of how the algorithm works from start to finish. You flip coins. Every time you flip a coin, you are creating these two bounds. And if at any point these two bounds fall entirely within one region, either completely to the left of alpha or completely to the right of alpha, we are done and we know that u is either less than alpha or bigger than alpha. And we just keep going and going until it eventually finishes. And it is guaranteed to finish because there's a 100% chance that there is some amount of space between u and alpha. And eventually this interval will fill up entirely that space and we will know uh, for sure if it's bigger than alpha or not. Notice, however, the amount of time it takes is random. And that's because we don't know how close u is going to end up being to alpha. So this algorithm, it always terminates after a finite number of rounds, but the amount of rounds is unknown and could be arbitrarily large. This is a little bit like saying, flip coins until you get your first heads, could take a long time. In fact, it could take any amount of time, any number of coin flips as possible in that situation. So this last little chapter, I want to explain 
why is the solution that I gave actually exactly the same as the solution that was given in that Michael Penn video. It's also the same solution you'll find if you look up uh, solutions to this Putnam problem. Um, and in that, so those solutions, you just flip coins until you get your first heads. And then you stop based on the binary digit of alpha. Um, and that seems a lot simpler than what I did. So I had these two bounds. Um, that seems a lot more complicated than just flipping until your first heads. But actually, they are exactly the same solution. And all you have to do is to think about the coin flips slightly differently. So in my video, I was using the coin flips to be the binary digits of U, which are, is equivalent to saying, is U in the left half or the right half of each of those pink intervals when we were doing the 20 questions game. To get the other solution, all you have to do, instead of asking left or right, you just say, is it in the same interval as alpha or is it in the opposite? So is U in the same half of the interval that's remaining as alpha or is it in the opposite half? Here's what that would look like. Uh, so looking at this pink interval over here, is U in the same half as alpha or a different half than alpha? It's in the same half as alpha. Okay, so now that we've divided by two, is it in the same half as alpha again or is it in a different half? It's in the same half as alpha again. Okay, but this time, is it in the same half as alpha or the other half? This time, it's in the same half as alpha once again. Okay, uh, follow-up question, is it in the same half as alpha or the other half? Would you look at that, it's in the same half as alpha again. Okay, but this time, is it in the same half as alpha or the other half? This time, it's in a different half than alpha. Wait a second, that means that it's not in the blue interval anymore. And so in this version of the game, the game only ends as soon as we get the answer, no, it's in the opposite version. So every time we're in the same interval as alpha, we have to keep playing the game over and over again, and that's because you and alpha are actually very close together. And the game ends exactly when we get the answer, no, it's in the opposite interval. And when it's in the opposite interval, what happens is, uh, U and alpha are in opposite halves of the interval. Does that mean that U is bigger than alpha or is that U is less than alpha? Well, it depends on is the binary digit of alpha one or zero. If the binary digit of alpha on that flip, in this example, uh, five, if the binary digit of that flip is one and U is in the opposite interval, that means that U must have been a zero and then U is less than alpha. Um, on the other hand, if the alpha digit is zero, then u must have been a one to be the opposite, and then u is bigger than it. So in this version of the game, you keep flipping and you keep asking, is it in the same interval as alpha or the opposite interval? And the game will continue. You will not be able to tell if you're fully in the blue interval or fully outside until you get the answer, it's in the opposite interval. And as soon as you get the answer, it's in the opposite interval, you will be able to tell. And the answer, is it less than alpha or bigger than alpha is precisely just what is that binary digit of alpha. And this is exactly the version that was presented in Michael Penn's video. So you can tell me which one you think is more intuitive. Is it uh, more intuitive to have this left right thing with the U's, uh, which I think is a little more visual at least, or do you like the other solution better where you flip coins and then you stop at the first heads? That one is definitely very slick to write up, but I think you lose some of the picture proof that I really like. Uh, let me know in the comments which one you like better.